Well, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And happy new year. Happy new year. Thank you. <laughs> one first. Happy new year. Happy new year. I want to speak this morning on the topic starting the new year off. Right or wrong? You're going to start it off one way or the other. Right or wrong? If you've sat under my preaching very long at all, you've heard repeatedly uh, this verse that I've used in invitations over and over again. Matthew 11, 28 and 29. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I'm meek and lowly in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls. Those are the words of Jesus, and that's his ongoing invitation to you and to me. And the words literally mean, I did some word study on it, the word come is a command that said come hither. It's an imperative. In other words, if you're going to have spiritual peace in your life, if you're going to inherit heaven and eternal life, you must come to him. For he is the only way. And he says, come to me all of you that labor and are heavy laden. Folks, that means everybody. That means the invitation is open to anyone who will respond. Those who labor, that means from toils and efforts. Anybody here on easy street in your life and not having any struggles? Uh, don't see many hands going up. Mine either. You know, but all of us get weary of our labors at times. And then he says, those who labor and are heavy laden. And what he means there is those who have laden upon you a burden. And what he's really speaking of there is religious ritual and do's and don'ts and rules of man that get heaped upon people, uh, hoops that, that religion expects you to jump through in order to obtain righteousness. Jesus says, come to me. I'm going to relieve you of all that. He said, I'll give you rest. And that is to relieve he said, take my yoke upon you. A yoke is like a, a, a beam or a thing that they put across the shoulders of an oxen to pull a plow. And you think of it as something that boy's going to lay a heavy burden on, but he says his yoke is light. His burden is light. The world lays a lot of pressure on you. Be this, do this, do that. Look this way. Work this way. Act this way to be accepted. I want to tell you, Jesus just says, come. And I'll give you rest. He says learn. That means to grow and increase in knowledge. And that's what we're all about here at Believer's Fellowship. Missions and making disciples. That's why we have small groups. That's why we're on a pilgrimage through the word of God together. To grow in knowledge. He says learn from me. That is Jesus himself. His Holy Spirit when you come to him. You're not a finished work. You're finished in that you're eternally secure. But you're not finished in, in terms of spiritual maturity. That's an ongoing process that will last your entire life. So learn from me. He says, for I'm meek. And that means gentleness of disposition. He's not harsh. Isn't that nice? Ever know any harsh pastors? I know a few. You know, they're like sandpaper. But I'll tell you what, Jesus is not that way. He's gentle in spirit. And he loves you right where you are. I'm lowly in heart, that is, of low degree. Not rank or pretense. You don't have to measure up to gain acceptance. I'll tell you, we, we operate in a lot of circles in my life. We go somewhere, some, you know, some folks are pretty prosperous and prominent. We go other places where folks uh, are struggling to survive. And I'll tell you what Jesus says, there's no, no rank. You don't have to gain admission. You just come to me. I'll, take you, I'll meet you right where you are. And you'll find rest for your souls. Aren't you tired of struggling? Aren't you tired of trying to measure up? Jesus says, I love you right where you are. Folks, I'm weary of seeing a lot of well-meaning church folks struggle in an effort to be right with God. And so that's why I want us to start off this new year on the same page. I want to see some folks in that struggle in your life and be set free of bondage. Some are bound in religious ritual. 
Others in our day are others in our day are flaunting grace like it's a, a display of arrogance. There's a lot of heresies out there being preached right now. Join this group. Walk this aisle. Go through baptism in order to be saved. Go through baptism to show you've been saved. Some are, oh, and there's another heresy being preached. Some are created for hell. Nothing you can do about it. It's amazing how the folks who preach that way are always convinced that they're chosen for heaven. There's another, the opposite extreme of that is no, you're already saved. You just better believe that you are. Everybody's okay. Not, no, Jesus said you must come to me. I mean, he makes it simple. He puts his bar down as low as it can go. He puts the cookies on the bottom shelf. But he says, you got to come. And I'll give you rest. There are a lot of heresies being preached right now. And it's, with so many mixed messages coming out of a lot of churches, is it any surprise that so many in the world don't want anything to do with it? It's really not. And a lot of people inside the church and out are totally confused. But my greatest concern is that within the church, there are those who are so convinced that they're okay with God that they won't even visit the possibility that they may not be. That frightens me. Have you truly, truly experienced His grace? I saw an evangelist once who was making the circuit some years ago, and he was reporting large numbers of conversions. And uh, when I went to one of his meetings, I uh, saw several, and I realized something as I listened to him preach. His preaching was designed to try to create doubt. And he, he said a lot of things that, that shook some people up who I'm not so sure needed shaking up because as one person told me, he said, you know, 20% of the people do 80% of the work. It was always the most spiritual, godly people in the church that kept getting saved over again. And his preaching was designed to sow doubt in people's assurance. Let me just assure you that's not my promise here today. But the Bible is very clear in Matthew 7, 21, that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. And doing the will doesn't mean doing church work. Although church work may be part of it, but the work of the church. And there's a difference. We'll talk about that more another time. But my purpose here is not to sow doubt, but my purpose here is to ask each and every one of us to make a close examination of where are you in your relationship with Jesus Christ. There are two types of people in this world, folks, saved and lost. And that's not the same as churched and unchurched. Not the same at all. So let's, let's look at, first of all, what does not save you. What will not save you? What will not get you to heaven at all? First of all, religion. Our study in Galatians is going to show us that's Paul's declaration of freedom from religious bondage. Paul said in Athens, he says, I see in all things you're quite religious. So they were religious, but they were lost. Pagan gods everywhere. I've been to India a couple of times, and I'll tell you, they're the most religious people I have ever seen anywhere. Altars all up and down the street. People praying all up and down the street. But a very dark place spiritually. Religion will not save you. Good works. Being a good person. I think you're all nice people. I think I'm a pretty nice guy. Hopefully most of the time. But you know, being a good person does not save you. I went on some, um, about 25 years ago on the streets of, uh, um, um, oh my goodness, a little town in West Tennessee. Um, and I was went on the street at night, on a Friday night, and I was doing a religious survey, uh, asking people, or sort of a questionnaire, have you come to the place in your spiritual life where you know for certain that if you died today, you would go to heaven? 
And I ask you to ask yourself that question. I'll say it again. Have you come to the place in your spiritual life where you know without a doubt that if you died today, you would go to heaven? Most people will say, well, I hope so. I think so. Friend, it's a yes or no question. And then the next question was, if you stood before God today and he said, why should I let you into heaven? What would you say? The question, you know, you would think in the buckle of the Bible belt that uh, Parsons, Tennessee was the town. You would think in that buckle of the Bible belt that just about everybody, just about everybody had some church affiliation. But you know something? Over 80% of the people were crediting their own goodness with getting them to heaven. Mm -hmm. Friend, if that's the object of your faith, you are lost. Charity work will not get you to heaven. I know some folks who are unbelievers, but they will quickly tout their charity work as a, uh, to demonstrate their righteousness. Folks, charity work's a great thing to do, but it will not save you. And this one is really popular in our day. Sincerity will not save you. There are a lot of people who are very sincere and are very sincerely wrong. Sincerity will not save you. Now listen carefully on this one. Confession of sin only. Someone who confesses their sin but does not go the rest of the way with it and come to him and place trust in him. The person who only confesses their sin. There are a lot of people like that. I know I do this and this and this and they'll tell you all the things they do. Confession actually means to agree with God about your sin. But some people say, well, they confess their sins and they think that makes them righteous. Friend, number one, you don't know what all your sins are. you got so many of them, but number two, that won't save you. Jesus saves. Joining the church will not save you. That's why we have membership by fellowship. Because some people put all of their faith in their church membership. I remember I served in one area, a rural area, where People, boy, everything, if you've been born, I'd ask those questions. If you come to a place you know for certain that you died today, you'd go to heaven. Oh, yeah, my letter's up at such and such a church. Well, okay, but let's get back to the question. You see, there are a lot of people putting their faith in their church membership. That cannot, will not save you. Baptism will not save you. I led a man to Christ a while back and and he was out of town and hadn't had a chance to baptize him. And his wife said, well, does that mean he's without protection? No. He's secure as anybody. Just needs to get him plugged into a church and help him follow through. But that does not save. So what does save? Wow, I'm doing all these things. And you're telling me none of that saves me? None of that gets me anywhere closer to heaven? I'm telling you, the only thing that can save you is grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. Amen. It's that simple. There was a man who uh, encountered an angel, and he asked about going to heaven. What do I, you know, what do I have to do? Because let me tell you, I've given millions of dollars to charity. I'm really good to my family. I've endowed a chair at the local university. I've given hundreds of thousands of dollars to my church and sent thousands to missionaries. The angel said, well, heaven's only about a half mile journey. He said, well, how far will that get me? He goes, about a half an inch. He said, a half an inch with all that effort? Man, the only way you can get there is by the grace of God. Amen. <laughs> that is the only way. Is through grace and grace alone. So, we're going to move one inch closer. And I'm going to tell you what, friend, I want you to make the whole journey today. But you make it not by righteousness, but by laying pride aside and placing trust in the one who loves you. How do we know if we're saved or not? How do we have assurance? Well, let me tell you one of the best sources of assurance is, first of all, 
evidence of salvation is are you totally relying on the grace of Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross and through his resurrection for salvation? Are you relying totally on him and him alone? Now, some people can say that. They can parrot the words and it might not be true. But that's one evidence of salvation. A second, and I think a greater thing that helps us know uh, salvation is the bearing of spiritual fruit. If you bear spiritual fruit, if you're born again and the Spirit of God dwells in you, you're able to love the unlovable. You're able to, you have an exuberant optimism regardless of your circumstances. Doesn't mean you don't weep and mourn, but it doesn't keep you down in the dumps. You've got joy. You've got a serene spirit even in the middle of life's storms. You're patient even with difficult people. Your heart reflects who you claim to be. Heart and actions, attitudes reflect who you claim to be. You're in fact charitable, consistent, and non-threatening. And under control, which means you have a bridal tongue. You ever met anybody that brags? I just say what I think. Well, shame on you. <laughs> That's not a smart thing to do. A person who is born again bears spiritual fruit. And those things I just described are, in fact, the fruits of the Spirit. Galatians 5, 22 and 23 says, The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Against such there is no law. So what is evidence of lostness? If those are evidences of being saved, what are evidences of lostness? Take the exact opposite. Hatefulness, anger, and I don't mean occasionally getting righteously indignant, some people say, well, I'm just righteously indignant, but they live in a perpetual state of it. Friend, that's not, that's not righteous indignation. That's just anger. Turmoil. Impatience. Dishonesty of the heart. That word for kindness literally translates moral integrity. <coughs> Meanness. Inconsistence. Harshly judgmental. And unbridled passions and an unbridled tongue. And like I say, some even brag about that. Philippian jailer came to Paul and Silas at night in Acts 16, 30, 31. He called for a light and he ran and he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Doesn't get any simpler than that. They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved and your household. Now, that word for believe means more than just intellectual assent. It means an embracing, a, a placing of trust. The church I served in, I was not on staff. This was before I uh, sensed God's call to ministry, just about the time. A man having trouble in his marriage called me one night, and I went to his house, and his wife was gone at the time. This man was active in church. He was faithful in attendance. He had all the evidences of the right thing. Did all the churchy stuff. Big burly guy, and he broke down crying and said, Steve, I need to be saved. He fell into the conviction and realized his need. Where are you today? Because the gospel is abundantly clear. <coughs> Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Our tendency is to compare ourselves with one another. And folks, that's worthless. If I'm going to compare my sin with somebody else, with, uh, with Ron Mathis, I'm going to take his worst and my least and go, well, see there, I'm okay. A lot of people I meet out in the field talking to them, well, I'm as good as any of those church people. I said, you know, I know them. You're better than some of them. That's not the point. All have sinned. All fall short. None of us qualify for heaven. 
Most of us work for wages, for pay. And the Bible's clear, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. When I was a little boy, I can remember believing that I could picture two giant chalkboards because when I'd go to school, if you did something bad, you'd have to put a check mark by your name. And I imagine that our life had a giant chalkboard and God was up there. If we did something wrong, he'd put a check mark. Did something good, he'd put a plus on the other one. And at the end of your life, he would weigh them. And if you had more pluses than check marks, you, you'd probably go to heaven. That's what I believed. And then I came to the realization, if there's one single check mark at all, I can't be saved. Except by his grace and grace alone. He will not accept sin into his presence because he's a holy and a righteous God. The wages of sin is death. That means eternal separation from God. Any sin whatsoever. Anybody here claim they haven't? Okay, well, confess pride then. You see, all have sinned and fall short. And the wages of sin, any sin, is separation from God. But the gift of God, gift, is eternal life in Christ Jesus. Anybody get any gifts in the last few weeks? You know, wow, some of you didn't raise your hand. I hope you got something. You know, did anybody get a gift in the last few weeks? Okay, everybody did. Did anybody hand it to you and say, oh, and here's the bill for it? <laughs> Virginia did. <laughs> No, a gift is something you cannot earn, you do not deserve, you just simply must receive. You can't earn or deserve. The gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And Romans 10, 13 says, Whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now that sounds pretty simple. But that word for call doesn't mean like picking up the smartphone doesn't mean that. No roaming charges calling on Jesus. But to call on Jesus means to allow oneself to be named, to adopt the surname, to make yourself one of his. In other words, time and all alone, I have given myself to him. I'm his and his alone. I trust in him, what he did on the cross, that he rose from the dead to save me. And friend, until you come to that point, you are lost. To invoke the name. A young man was brought before Julius Caesar. Excuse me. Alexander the Great. Get my story straight. Brought before Alexander the Great, he was accused of cowardice. But Alexander saw he was a young man, tender in heart. And he took a soft spot for him and he said, Young man, what is your name? He said, Alexander, my king. He said, What is your name? He said, Alexander. Sir, his face grimaced and he looked at him and he said, you change your conduct or you change your name. What is your name? And you invoke the name of Christian, Christ follower. And it is that evidence in your life, that spiritual fruit being born out. If it is not, you need to place your trust in in him and him alone. There's a book. And let's just, like a book of your sin. Well, tell you what, let's use Ron Mathis's book. There you go. Uh, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Let's just, let's just say that book, let's say this represents a book. And it represents my sin. And here's my life. And here's God. And here's my sin. And I try being religious. I try being good. I try going to church. I try being baptized. There's something still between me and God. What is it? Sin. My sin. 
So we say, you know, it's New Year's. I'm going to turn over a new leaf. And guess what? There's still something wrong between me and God. And that thing is. So, okay, it's time. I'm going to turn my life around. There's still something wrong between me and God. Friend, you can't work it up. You cannot earn it. You must come to Christ right where you are. That revival I preached in Parsons, Tennessee that week, a man came to faith, uh, came to uh, came to witness to a fellow, and boy, he was living a horrible lifestyle. He was a reputation one of the meanest guys in the county. And he said to me, I would not ever want to do what you're saying unless I knew I could do it right. And I said, well, that's just your problem. You can't do it right. You have to come to him and trust him right where you are and trust him to make you a new person. And he can and he will. And that man came that last night of the revival and said, I need Jesus bad. And God restored his marriage post-divorce and healed him. That was many years ago. He's been following Christ all this time. I sat in that chair a while ago. I believe that chair will hold me up. But it's not holding me up, is it? Why not? Not in it. In order for me, my trust to be in that chair, what do I have to do? Sit in it. Sit in it. I would demonstrate that. It'd be my luck it would collapse right then. But the point is you don't know Christ until you have transferred your trust from self to him and him alone. Anything before that, you're just a religious good person. But you can be religious and lost. Friend, his grace is so sweet. His love is so pure. And he offers it to you today. John 6, 40, Jesus said, This is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son, believes in him, may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up the last day. But that believe is not just, yeah, I believe all that. No, that believe is, I invoke his name. I become his child. I'm going to trust him and him alone with my life and my eternity. That is the essence of salvation. This message today should do one of two things. Either give you great comfort or great discomfort. Rest or unrest. If unrest, this is the time and the day to set it. Folks, let's start this new year all on the same page. This is the time to settle it. You have unfinished business with the Father. Now, walking an aisle will not save you, but I want to tell you, walking an aisle is a demonstration of your trust. I'm trusting Him and Him alone. And I can assure you, you're in a room full of people who love you and encourage you, and in no way judge or condemn you, because we've all been there, and some still are. Jesus says, come to me if you labor, if you're ahead of you laden. That means you've been trusting other things. He says, I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm meek, I'm lowly in heart, and you'll find rest for your soul. Friend, our Lord Jesus loves you. He wants to walk through with you through this life and guide your steps. <clears throat> Don't go on struggling trying to make it on your own. Let him have his way in you today. You say, well, you know, I'm not so sure. Well, I'm going to tell you, if this message is making you uncomfortable, it's time to get sure. Mm -hmm. It's time to give him your heart and life. And, well, I'm not comfortable. He doesn't know it. Well, no, I don't know it. But that's the Holy Spirit knocking at your heart's door right now. Saying, I stand at the door and knock. If you'll open your heart's door, I will come in and fellowship with you. I've never seen a person make that decision for Christ and regret it. This is the moment. This is the time. As we stand together and sing, this altar is going to be open for you to come and pray. I'd be willing to love to pray with you. I'd be honored to. But you let the Father have his way. Let this be the day that he sets you.
Lord, we praise you and thank you that your message is so simple, so clear, and your gift so abundant. Lord, how sad that we let personal pride get in the way of receiving the greatest of gifts. Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. No one's going to come to the Father except through you. Set some people free even now. We ask in Jesus' name. God's people said, stand together.